Yeah, I want to say first and foremost, I appreciate you joining the conversation, man, and just doing this off the love, man. Like, I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to say that first and foremost, man. Uh, and, and before we get started, um, I just wanted to uh, say a, a, a funny little story. The, the last time I had seen you was at the Dave Chappelle show. And uh, when you had walked in, I was like, bro, I did not even know who you were, bro. I did not know who you were. Like, I until I had uh -huh. seen the ring, the goat ring. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's Royce. <laughs> I was like, what's up? Bro? And it's, funny. It, it, it's crazy, man. Uh, but yeah, man, it's beautiful to have you uh, here in this conversation. So I just wanted to have a, a real quick conversation about mental health. We actually did a panel um, on one of the college campuses yesterday um, about mental health. Uh, Courtney was there. Uh, so Courtney flew in and then my partner Spank flew in and we... Uh, talked to about 40 students uh, yesterday um, at North Carolina Central University. Um, so um, it was a powerful conversation. Um, so this is just kind of something that I've been looking to do and um, I partner with uh, Revolution of One. I'm one of their ambassadors. So we just doing conversations on IG Live. And I thought you was the perfect person to do it with because I know you're really big in the mental health space um, with, with, with your nonprofit as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you about um, the panel that you hosted last year for Revolt. Um, their mental health panel. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to do that, and, and why was mental? Why is mental health important to you? Um, mental health is important to me. Well, I decided to do that first of all to answer your first question because of how important mental health is to me, and not to sound not to sound cliche, but it just started being important to me. Um. Mm -hmm within like the last 10 years, maybe. And uh, mm. I decided to get sober 10 years ago. You know what I mean? And I learned a lot over mm. these 10 years. I decided to get sober. So alcohol is my, you know, that's my vice. That's my Achilles heel. You know what I mean? So that's my kryptonite. Mm. For, for the people who think I'm the lyrical Superman, that's my kryptonite. That's the one thing. That's the common denominator that'll fuck up everything. You know mm. what I mean? Like. So, you know, some people can drink responsibly. I personally are not one of those people. So um, mm. when I decided to get sober, um, it was strongly recommended to me that I go see a therapist. So um, due to the way that therapy is stigmatized in our community, um, I fell into that category. I don't need to go to no therapy. I let them talk me into it. So I went into, I went into therapy thinking to myself, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to talk about addiction problems. I'm going to talk about, you know, problems I was having with, with, with alcoholism. Maybe I may go in a little bit into, you know, some of the things that were going on in my relationship. That's the mm -hmm. most I thought that we would. So, because, you know, I went into, I went into therapy with this pre-existing, pre-existing thought in my mind of what it, what it is just based off whatever. I don't even know where it comes from. And, um, I think it's that fear of the unknown that just makes you apprehensive about going mm -hmm. and talking to somebody and, you know, vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know, who, who, who's, who can be vulnerable? How is that easy? People think that that's mm -hmm. like, you know, if you get on a record and you talk about how, you know, I beat you, you know, I'll shoot you up. Yeah. People think that's being yeah. strong. That's easy. That's easy to do. Anybody can talk like that, but how, yeah. How much, how much courage do you have to talk about how how wrong you've done, how wrong you've done, or or mm. how you're changing a little bit, especially when you've developed a following of people who enjoy you being self-deprecating, you know. So I was mm. battling a lot of thoughts like that in my mind, and I was making a lot of decisions based off of. Uh, trying to make sure that I keep my fan base and um, kind of running my life like it's a Royce to five nine business and not me as a person. You know, I'm not just a rapper, man. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm many other things. And, you know, all of the years where I wanted to break myself up into all of these different people, it just wasn't working for me. So I went to therapy. And one thing that I learned in therapy, I think, I think it may have been the first the first time that I talked to Pete, I talked to my man, Pete, 
And um, he's not even like a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He's a, um, he's, he's, he, he's certified in something, but he's more of a sponsor. He's a former addict himself. Mm. So he gets fulfillment out of making sure that we, you know, we stay on track. You know, that's how the sobriety world works. It's like a community. It's like a family. <laughs> yeah. So I'm talking to Pete. He's a UK guy. He's not a black dude. UK guy. White guy. We talking. He started asking me questions about my relationship with my dad. <clears throat> um, We started, you know, I started going back, you know, reminiscing. I talked about some good times. I talked about some, some times that I felt bothered me a little bit. But I told him, I remember him asking me, he, he didn't do a lot of talking. I remember him asking questions like, hmm, how'd that make you feel? Hmm, how do you feel about that? And I think he was trying to see if I was actually able to articulate how I felt about these things. And I think a lot of us can't. And to me, mm. that's what the purpose of therapy is, you know? So um, the more I started talking to him, and the, the way that he was leading the conversation, it was making it easier and easier for me to unpack these feelings. So what, what ended up happening was I looked up and I was in tears. Mm. And I haven't, I haven't cried. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know when I cried. <laughs> That's how mm. many times it is, you know what I mean? So what I took away from that was First of all, communication is something else. It's something else. It's an art to it. You know, we can speak, we can speak, you know, but if we're conversing, we're talking about something totally different. We can argue. Me and you can yell about whatever mm. the problem is. But, yeah. but we can also do the opposite, which is both of us are saying things to each other. We're pontificating. We're, we're, we're looking for a solution. We're being solutionary. Now we're getting somewhere, right? So that's what I kind of picked up in therapy and it became a passion of mine. One, because of the way that it affected me and how much I felt like I developed and being an alcoholic, I felt like I went many years not developing at all. You miss out on a lot of development when you take your, you take your mind to another place that's not progressive like how can you mm. like the most important years of brain development are your early 20s and beyond i started drinking mm. at 21 by the time i was 25 26 i was heavy drinking so if i'm in a you know a constant state of inebriation you know um all of the college kids and all the development that they were doing and the way that they learn people skills and and when they started to accumulate all of these resources that they were able to use later on in life, I missed out on all of that because I jumped right into mm. the music business and hopped right into the party side of it. Like it was one big party and that's a mistake, you know, but it's a, it's okay because I didn't have anybody to tell me to do it any other different way. I learned, I did it the way that I thought that it was, it was done because success mm. It's something that's marketed to us, you know. Like I, I, our idea of what success is is what, what what they're showing us on TV and what we see on our computers, you know. Mm. But when you go to therapy and you start talking to people, you start to realize how important it is to not just strengthen your, you know, your your physical. But if this is weak, everything is weak, and you can't be fun. You can't mm. be functional, and you can't. You can't progress. And what happens is when you stay in that state for a long enough period of time, it's very easy to accept it. And that's being accepting is the worst thing you can be, especially in the music business. You don't have to mm. accept. It's always another level. It's mm. always another level to go up. I can buy you a Ferrari right now. I guarantee you in six months, you'll be thinking about a Lamborghini. That's just mm. that's just human nature. You know what I mean? So if, if other groups of people can do it, so can we. But, you know, we got to learn how to communicate. And we got to, 
let me tell you what I'm working on right now as a man. Mm. Because you yourself, you follow me. I know you've been following me. I'm kind of a mentor of yours to a certain extent. You know what I mean? Yep. And I f with you heavy because I feel like you wise beyond your years. And I just, I see something in you that I don't even know if you see in yourself, but it's greatness. It's greatness on mm. a lot of levels. And I feel like it's my job as an OG to help nurture that. However I can. I'm going to tell you right now. If we can't learn how to communicate with each other, which it won't happen without therapy. Every black person needs therapy. Every single last one of us. We think it's this thing that happens when, you know, like we go see somebody when everything's wrong. Nobody can fix you. It's the same with mm. addiction. Nobody can snap a finger or, you know, give you accurate. And I wanted to ask you, how, how much do you think that plays a part um, in some of the behavior issues and in some of the young men in the schools? Because that's kind of um, the mental health space that we're talking about today is the young men in the school and young women. But how much of that do you feel like plays a part um, for a lot of the anger um, for a lot of the young men in the schools um, in some of their behavior issues? You mean, you mean, you mean um, the presence or lack thereof of having a man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the lack, the lack of. The lack of. Um, yeah. I don't even know if I can give you a percentage, but I can tell you, I mean, it has damn near everything to do with it. You know, another mm. thing I learned being in therapy is all things matter. All things matter, man. No, nothing's by, nothing is just by chance. You know what I mean? Like I was, mm. I was learning, I would be talking about something that I wouldn't have even thought to link to something else. And I started to realize that all things correlate. You know, ev everything, every decision that you made, everybody that was missing, everybody that was present, the way that you engaged with them, the things that they did in front of you, everything that you've taken in as a person all the way up to this point made you everything you are right now. You know? So... <clears throat> If you have the wherewithal to be able to look at that, you know, I know everybody claims to be on the quest for knowledge, but it's really about being able to having the strength to be able to admit the things that you don't know. You know what I mean? Like mm. everybody just wants to be correct, man. Nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to even sometimes I, I talk to my son and I, I ask him questions and I'm not I'm not quizzing him or asking him questions. Mm. Because because I want him to, I want I want to know that he knows. I'm hoping he doesn't know. I'm hoping he doesn't mm. know, and he's strong enough to tell me, "Nah, I don't know that." Because now I know I can teach him. You can learn. You can learn. But when it's like, yeah, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I know about that too. I know about yeah. I know about that. Me and my team, we got this going on. We got that going on. Look, bro, it's okay not to know everything. You know what I mean? Mm. It's really, it's really, it's really more about listening than it is talking, you know, and, and with the, mm. with the end, with the internet, the emergence of just tech in general, like the way the technology is evolving, it's giving you so much information at the, that the end of your fingertips, information is to be seeked out to you. You're supposed to be able to seek information. Now, information is kind of like chasing you around. And it's so much mm. to the point now you are unable to decipher what's correct, what's not. Everything has a flip side to it. Some things are correct. Some things are based in truth, mm. which is slightly incorrect. Some things are just a made-up conspiracy that correlates mm. to the truth a little bit. It's so messed up with everything. Anybody can just type anything on the internet and, you know, some people take that in and consider it law, you know, and it's hard to grab a hold of the right book. And it's hard. I'm even going through this myself. It's hard to um, stop my mind from moving so fast and helping myself be able to focus on actually reading a book. You know what mm. I mean? Like the last three books that I've taken in have all been audio books. I'm working on yeah, a book right yeah. now. First thing I'm thinking about, audio book. 
You know what I mean? Like, that's great, but, you know, it could be stifling in some ways, you know? Like, when Quincy Jones felt like he needed to learn how to read and write string progression. You know what I mean? Mm. Now with the emergence of te- technology, you don't have to le- you don't have to know how to write or read music anymore. For what? For what? You got you got programs that can do everything for you. You know what I mean? You got mm. programs that basically can make a beat for you. You go on Fruity Loops right now and you come as close as you you can come as close as you want to to a key and it'll throw the shit in the right key. You know what I mean? Like mm. you put drums and you just put them in, okay. The- the kick goes on one, the snare goes on three. Everybody know that one, three, seven, nine, whatever, whatever. You just dial and shit in. You know what I mean? Back in the day, it was a metronome, and you would have to program the drums to the metronome using your rhythm and your natural inclination for music. So it was a little mm. bit more talent talent based than it was a mind thing. So now we're dealing with a situation where anybody who has an inclination to play video games. And can be a tech guy who's smart with using phones and tech technology and good with using equipment can make the same kind of beat that fucking Timberland can make. Mm. That's really. I want to touch on something that you said. I want to touch on something that you said earlier because that's that it was powerful um, about everything is correlated. I'm just learning that. Like I'm like, dang, that was that was prolific, man. And even when you. Mm-hmm. Like positive attentions can have negative effects. Like, and that's kind of what I learned. Like, I feel like my parents really raised me in like the, the the closest way to perfection. But it's just like even things that we do with good intentions can have negative effects, man. Like I we was talking about, we was having a conversation yesterday, and I was talking about homeschool, being raised in homeschooling, and how that's very positive. But even positive things can have negative effects because if you homeschooling a child. And you're curating their environment, like the, 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 the children that they're conversing with, then you handicap them on the back end because all the children that they're going to interact are going to be good children later on in life. So you you're curating their social circle to oh the type of children that you like. But then when they go off to school, they got to be around all types of children. So now they're handicapped because they don't know how to be around everybody. And it's just like for you to say that it's just like it took me a long time to admit that because it's just like I don't want to admit that good parenting can have negative effects in a bad world. Like you doing good things in a bad world can still have a negative effect because you're not taking how crazy the world is in account. So if for you to say that, it's just like, man, like that's a yeah, fact, it's a good, like, it's that's good, it's a good, fact. it's good parenting. It's good parenting, but there's no such thing as it's perfect because mm. the United States is not, it's not set up. It's not set up for us to be in a perfect position. See, what your parents did was they went with the lesser of the evils. Okay? Mm. So they made sure that they instilled in you the proper information. So now you're equipped for the world in a way where you know what to look for. You know how to talk and carry yourself when you're being pulled over by the police. You're not out there green thinking that everybody is your friend white in mm. any other culture people you know what i mean you, you took in you you know history you have a better grasp of history than you would have if you had been taught in a regular public school curriculum that's really meant to protect a lot of different things and there's a lot of different agendas and motives and there's a whole lot of red tape and shit that goes that that's behind that you know what i mean but then, on the other hand, on the flip side of it, what about your social development? And that's just mm. as important. So it's kind of like, I wish I could have homeschooled my kids. Number one, I don't think I would have been able to. My wife yeah. is smart enough to do that. You know what I mean? But mm. what we did was we ran into the issue of we wanted our kids to have a better education than us. We both grew up um, in not poverty-stricken environments, but we didn't have much, me or her, her family or us. We grew up in Oak Park, you know what I mean? So um, 
we grew up around a lot of black kids. We grew up around a lot of white kids, lived around a lot of white kids, but mostly black kids. Oak Park is a small city. It's a public school. It didn't have a whole lot of funding. You know what I mean? So there wasn't really any um, out of this world teachers that I had like such a super connection with, you know? So what would happen was my mom and my dad would go to parent teacher conferences and whatever the teacher said, that's what it was. Never, ever did the institution get questioned. Never have I heard mm. my dad, no matter how great of a dad I feel my dad is, my dad is my hero. I don't give a f what he did wrong. You know what I mean? Mm. But, you know, because his main concern was one of my kids are going to go to the NBA, be a pro boxer, something like that. You know, that's, that generation, that's how they thought. We're going to raise athletes because they yeah. knew what they could do. My dad was yeah, a stand out everything. Yeah. My dad was awesome in everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we we ended up um, being kind of like the same. Me and all my brothers, we excelled in basketball. We excelled, really excelled in basketball. And the things that held us back the most was popularity and being able to adjust to, to, to getting the right grades to stay eligible. You know what I mean? Like I would be having a kick-ass year and then next thing you know, I'm sitting out for a semester because grades, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So much to the point where my big brother and me, we pretty much had the same effect on Oak Park High School. We developed a reputation. So by the time my younger brother, Kid Vicious, by the time it was time for him to go to high school, my dad said, you ain't going to Oak Park. Mm -hmm. So listen to me. Listen to me. He refinanced the house. He took a loan mm. out on the house to put Vicious at Orchard Lake St. Mary so he can go to a prep school and have a better shot at basketball than we did. So quite naturally, mm. he did better in basketball. And that's why he's a better basketball player than me today. But that is subjective. Mm. That's, that's rather here nor there. So he's a better basketball player than me today. That's what they were willing to do. And then my youngest brother, so he wouldn't have to go to Old Park. They sent him to Berkeley. So mm. he had to go live with my cousins in order to go to Berkeley every day so that he wouldn't go to Old Park. So what ended up happening when I finally had kids, I was fortunate enough to make some money to, to you know, pretty early. You know, like I went, out and got a deal at 20 years old. I got a million dollar deal at 20 years old. So we, mm. the first thing we did is we moved out to the suburbs. So my teach, my children were able to reap the benefits of a better curriculum, more funding. I can just name a bunch of things, but you know, it's a downside to that too. Yeah. Yeah. They go into school. They go into school with mostly white children, okay? The way the way that my daughter views what the standard of beauty is, is based off of what she's mm. around every day. Social mm. pressure, social pressure is a, that's a whole nother beast. The music they listen to, how they like to dress, it's based on what's popular where they are. All right. That's a lot easier for me and his mom, for me and her mom to deal with today than it was for me in my early 20s. When Roycey, who I had mm. when he was 20, the first time he told me he wanted a pair of Skechers, I wasn't mature enough yet for him to ask me that. You know what mm. I told him? I told him, hell no, you're not getting no Skechers. I'm getting you some Jordans, <laughs> which was yeah. the wrong answer. You know what I mean? But that's what happened when a child yeah, yeah, raises yeah. a child. So the point I'm making, mm -hmm. there's no perfect way. There's a double-edged sword, no matter how you do it. It's all about what are you looking to achieve and what are the lesser of the evils, you know? And also our perspective changes so much daily as black men. If you ask me right now at 45 years old, if my wife just had a child, let's say right now, I'd be like, let's move to Africa. And I don't want anybody, mm. and, and I say this respect. I say this with all respect. I don't want anybody who's not black teaching my child anything. 
Mm, that's how I feel today. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, and my wife may, may not even agree with that, bro. It's like, it's like, and that's another, that's another challenge. Cause it's like, I'm not forcing, I'm not forcing her to do anything she's uncomfortable with either. So there's like so many variables, so many intangibles to adulting as a black person, especially one that's somewhat successful, considered successful. Yo, man, the only thing we can do to change a lot of these dynamics is things together. And mm. I just don't understand why it's so hard to pull that trigger. That's it. So, and, and I have another question about, about the schooling. Um, I was back when I was working in my old high school was that there's not a lot of black male teachers, counselors, you know, staff members that are not, you know, outside of the disciplinary staff, especially at like public schools. Um, do you feel like, 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 what, what do you think is the reason for the lack of like black male representation in the inner city schools? And do you think that is something that could help with a lot of the behavioral issues if you have like mentors and figures that you can look up to in the school? Absolutely. I'm 100% positive that that can help. We've seen the results of it. Look what Jalen Rose is doing with his academy. You know, mm. information, information is the most important and it's the most viable, highest selling thing right now, today, currently. Information. Mm. I'm talking about yep. whether it's books, whether it's, you ever heard of Tony Robbins? You ever seen what one of his yeah, seminars yeah. look like? Pack. They do it in arenas. They do it in arenas. Mm. Going mm. to a Tony Robbins sem seminar over the weekend, it's like going to a fucking Drake show. Mm. They're in arenas and people are paying upwards of hundred, two thousand, two hundred thousand dollars to hear this man teach them about business. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So the information, the information is key. And what's happening is. Guys like Tony Robbins are big. They're huge in that community because people choose to receive that information from him. We mm. just have different sources that we prefer to hear it from. A lot yeah. of us are saying the same thing. Some people prefer Dr. Umar. Some people prefer Tariq Nasheed. Some, you know what I mean? Like, it don't matter because at the end of the day, we all trying to get to the same place. We just have different methods. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like build a community of people who prefer the way that you disseminate the same information that everybody else is pretty much speaking. Dave mm. Chappelle and Paul Mooney. Dave Chappelle and Paul Mooney are the same. They're the same. Dave Chappelle is just very disarming and very brilliant with the way that he chooses his words. And that's another reason why comedy is such an important profession. It's important mm. because it's a way to bring people together. You, you see me at the Dave Chappelle show, right? Did you see the, mm -hmm. the, the mixture of people that were in there? Yeah. Did you see, yeah. right? He, know, he yeah. knows how... He knows how to speak to issues that are important that we need to hear about, but he knows how to do it in a way where we can all laugh about it together. And I think that's godly. That's godly. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and then what Paul Mooney does or did, God rest his soul, is greatness because I think what he was doing, he, he was doing something at a time where it was time to make people a little bit uncomfortable. Cause I think that's necessary too. The mm. truth is not going the truth is not always designed for your comfort, you know? So mm. I think what we do sometimes in our community is we choose one over the other, but for whatever reason, and I think there is a reason, there's always a reason. And I link everything back to slavery, but that's just my personal take on it. But I think what we yeah. do is we choose we choose the messenger who we prefer and we condemn all the other messengers because it's not like the messenger that we prefer. Because mm. 
we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And it's causing division in our community. And the people, and I don't feel like all groups of people mean us wrong, but they don't all mean us well either. And the ones who don't mean us well, pray off of that. It's called divide and conquer for a reason. The divide, mm -hmm. they, eat, they smell blood, they utilize it, and they conquer. So now mm -hmm. we're we spending a whole lot of time yelling about the problem. We've known what mm -hmm. the problem is for hundreds of years, man. We know what the problem is. We know what hasn't changed. Yeah. We know what needs to be done. Yeah. I'm all out of I'm all out of talk, man. I'm all out of talk. I can't I can't I can't speak to every single issue because there's too many to speak to. It's time to just mm. do because the time that I'm spending speaking to these issues, I could be utilizing that valuable time because we don't have time. I could be use, utilizing mm. that valuable time to take my little baby steps and just do what I can. I'm not claiming to be, you know, the guy who's changing everything out here. But even something as small as is taking the steps and getting on the phone calls and taking the necessary steps to even start an organization that's going to even begin to start to help. I don't care if it's just mm. like two people. That's two more than it was. Mm. And a lot of times we don't even realize what problems need to be fixed until we're actually able to get lucky enough to make it out of the environment, to look back at it in retrospect and say, wow, mm. this needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. We need to fill this void. We need to fill that void. So what are you going to be, brother? Are you going to take the steps? Mm. Or are you going to sit around talking about how everybody ain't taking the steps? And even to add insult to injury, talk shit about the people who taking the steps and you not taking them. You want to be one of those people because to me, those people are more, they are more of a detriment to us than even the, the so-called oppressor. Mm. You know? Oppression is only, so what, oppression is a, it's a systemic thing. It's a systemic mm. thing. What we do to earn our millions that we think is a lot of money. And mm. it is because it's it, it's a lot of money in contrast to what we come from, but it's yeah. not a lot of money in contrast to what we're generating and what's being made off of us. And I don't think mm. that that's considered that's considered enough because somewhere down the line we've developed this every man for himself kind of uh, mentality and ideology. And um, if you can get to a position where you got a couple million that's the safe zone for us. You, it just, it, it takes away a lot of the fears that we grew up having. We don't want to lose that. So very rarely do you see anybody willing to put that on the line. And, and, and two, the ones who you've seen that were willing, that were willing to put their lives on the line for it made it very obvious that that's what they were willing to do. And they consequently lost their lives. Mm. So it's a scary thing to think about. So to me, I don't think that there's any enemies anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that there, yeah. I think we're to a point now where we not, we need to stop thinking about other groups of people. They can't, they couldn't fix us if they wanted to. And a lot of them are the ones who broke us in the past, but now mm. we're breaking ourselves. So we need to figure mm. out, how we could take steps and put all of our focus on one another. And like Frederick Douglass said, it's easy to build the youth. It's easier to build the youth than it is to fix broken men. You know, mm. so now we're we looking at just like I had to look at sobriety, you know, it was like a tornado whipping behind me the whole time that I was on, on an alcoholic, just rage and binge getting myself in all kinds of, compromised positions when I decided I didn't want that so want that for myself anymore I had to turn around and face the carnage I had mm. to look at everything that tornado whipping around me created and I had to dig through that carnage and I had to determine what's worth salvaging and what has to be left behind 
whatever mm. you want the new you to be, whoever this person is, this new you, who you're going to become, who you're very capable of becoming, it's going to cost you the old you. You can't have mm. it both ways. You know what I'm saying? So now we're just about I- taking steps. So how do you think we make therapy more palatable for, for young people? Because I know it's becoming a more normalized conversation, but do you think like most, uh, I say college students, high school students, middle school, like, you know, younger, younger people uh, are ready to go straight into a therapy like type of setting? Or do you think like they need like baby steps to kind of get them to that level. Maybe they need to do just like group circle conversations or something like in between that. Or do you feel like it's good to just put them in that environment where the therapist are kind of seeing how they react to it? Because I remember when I, I, I had did one therapy session after my father had passed away when I was 10. And it just wasn't for me. It was awkward. It was, it felt very invasive. And it was just like, it felt like, it, it was just really invasive. And it was just, Cause I'm not used to telling, you know, it's just like, you know, in the black household, we tell not to tell our family business, like, you know, and it felt something like that. Like, it felt like I was my family and that was my business. And it's just like, yo, this is my personal business. I keep things inside. Like you ask me for information that like, you're not family. Like I can't tell you this. It takes and a it lot was of, just take, like, it takes a lot of, take a lot of trust. And mm, how, yeah, how, just, how, could, how could you possibly how could you possibly have that kind of trust for a complete stranger when you don't even trust yourself? You know? Mm. But then again, look at it like this. How can I love my wife when I don't know how to love myself? Who taught me Mm. how to love myself? Who taught me how to love my wife? Who? What do you think? That's just a natural natural Mm. thing that we just do. We are broken people. We need to be fixed and we need to take steps to fix them. So to answer your question, all of those things that you put on the table are great ideas. One of them may work for somebody. Another may work for somebody. One may not work. Look at it like this. You went to a therapy session, right? You spoke to somebody Mm -hmm. who just didn't nail it with you. It's just like finding a barber. Every bar, every bar mm. that you've used ain't, ain't kill it. You got to find the right one. Sometimes, sometimes I've had barbers that, that did a great job, but I ain't particularly like their personality. Mm. And to me, that's a big deal. We get my haircut. That, that's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. Listen, listen. Let me tell you something, my brother. If you can get in an Uber, somebody's car that you activated through an application. It ain't even Mm. an office. It's just an application where somebody gonna bring their car that they drive every day. You don't know this person. You don't know what they got in their car. You don't know if it's a body in the car. You don't know if they got roaches in the car. You don't know if they got disease in the car. And you so Mm. trusting, because you want to get to where you gonna go, because you're thinking about the convenience. Mm. More so than your safety, right? Mm. So you get in the Uber and you have good experiences. I've had Uber drivers come pick me up drunk as hell, playing the street lords, loud as hell, driving Mm. me home. Because they think that's what I want to listen to. How do you know I want to listen to one of my dead homies loud as hell at three in the morning while Mm. you're drunk as hell driving me home? And I don't even know if I'm so Mm. sure I want you knowing where I live at. You know what I mean? Mm. Can you imagine how it feels to jump into an Uber at two in the morning and the first thing you hear, what up, though? What up, though, five nine? Damn. Damn. You know what I'm saying? So it's like... it's crazy. If you can get in an Uber, then you can try a few therapists until you find the right one. Because I guarantee you, if you if you find the right one... I heard Snoop speaking on this one time. And he said he ended up going with a white man therapist mm. because one one would assume that you would need a you would need to talk to a black person mm. i don't personally agree with that but i do recommend it you know what i mean i don't personally agree with that because the first therapist that i ever talked to is a white is a white man 
from the UK who I developed a very, very good relationship with. Learned a lot from him. And um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be such an advocate for therapy, you know? Mm. But at some point, um, you ever heard of spirit? You know who spirit is? Talk to spirit on um, on IG. You should follow her. <clears throat> I did a panel. I did a panel one time. I got invited to do a panel. I believe it was on mental health, but it also touched on some other things. Man, I didn't know the lady. She broke down basically the psyche of the young black man and the things that we must have been went through mentally in a way that it affects the way in which we engage on this planet. The black experience mm. is just something different. But the way that she broke it down, it was like somebody that I knew already. I felt like I was listening to one of my aunties. And I was thinking to myself, like, damn, man, I wish I had an auntie like this that I could have grew up speaking to that could have gave me a different perspective. But she just disarmed me in such a way. I fell in love with her. So what I did mm. was I asked, I asked my publicist if she can get in touch with her. And every now and then, I call her assistant, send the PayPal over, and set up sessions just to talk to her. Mm. Sometimes I want to ask her questions. Some, sometimes I want to get, I ask questions when I want to hear something from a from the perspective of a black woman. You know what I mean? Mm. Who better to talk to than an educated black woman who dedicates her life to understanding what I've been through? You know what I mean? Mm. It's no different from somebody, a guy having both parents like myself. I love my mom and my dad the same. I still speak to my mom one way and my dad another way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some things I feel comfortable talking to my dad about, some things I feel more comfortable talking to my mom about. That's the beauty of having both parents. Most mm. black kids don't have that. You know what I mean? So I think when you have that, that kind of dichotomy in your life and you start to notice the benefits that come from being able to have options like that, it opens your mind up to a new way of communicating and it makes you a little bit more open to the possibility of maybe something like therapy because the way mm -hmm. that it's presented to you prior to is presented to you like you, Oh, you in therapy. Oh, that's crazy. And it's also mm -hmm. not even in amenity. That's what I call it in amenity. It's not even in amenity that's readily available to you in the hood. That's why, the first thing that I did when I started the Ryan Montgomery Foundation was I developed this number right here. 1833 Royce 59. Mm. Now let me now, now I want you to listen to me close. If you live in the in the in the Michigan area, in the greater Detroit area, all you had to do or have to do is call that number. You can speak to somebody, but I got together with NAMI, who is the the, big, the biggest organization in Michigan dealing with mental health. And I got, also got together with CNS, who's the biggest mm -hmm. organization of mental health facilities around the city, in the city, that most of us don't even know exist, that they're there. I mm -hmm. partnered up with both of them with my Ryan Montgomery Foundation. So when you call that number, you can speak to somebody Somebody can come out to you or you can be delegated to a facility if you need to be. Because mm. personally, I feel like we have to get to a point where when we dial 911, the first person who we're talking to is a mental health specialist or person. I don't think police, I don't think police need to show up every time somebody dials 911. My child dialed 911 exactly. You know how kids do that from the house phone. My child dialed 911 recently, and the police showed up to my door. And um, I wasn't there. But the way my wife explained it, I ain't like that shit. They meant mm -hmm. well. You guys sure everything's okay? You, you sure everything's okay? But it was like dudes in the back with their hands on their gun, in formation, in different, you know, kind of like surrounding the crib a little bit. 
you know, the lady was talking respectful. She wasn't like out of line or anything like that. But I don't care. That could be a dangerous situation. Period. Mm. Do I need to see? Because I live in the city. I live in Farmington. So I live in the city where, you know, they don't got a lot of action. So when they get a call, they ready. They ready. They on go time. You know what I mean? Mm. And I don't need 10 white police officers on go time when it's a cat in the tree. I don't need that. You know what I mean? There could be mm. anything. On, there could be anything going on. But at the end of the day, it's only costing us our lives. It's not yeah. happening to everybody. It's us. You know what I mean? So I think protocol needs to change. I think systems need to change. I think the way that um that we that we view just everything in general needs to you people need to at least be open to looking at things a different way. And I think we're taking steps in the right direction. But until we can get to that place, which will never be a monolith in the black community, white people aren't even a monolith. Arabic people aren't a monolith. Asian people aren't a monolith. You know, we got to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm not going to talk mm. about Kanye West, but I'm going to make this point. Listen, man, there's some things he says that I understand where he's coming from. I think um, I wish the brother could choose his words a little bit better. You know what I mean? But, bruh, we got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time because everything that he's saying isn't wrong. There's a lot of things that he's doing that's wrong. But we also got to we, we got to look at what the what the ramifications would be of us standing in solidarity to condemn him. We have to start mm. thinking about what it does to us before we can think about anything else. We have to, you know, and it's OK to be silent. It's OK not to speak on it. You know, what I mean, it's OK not to speak on everything you disagree with that another black man has to say. People are going through things, man. It's a global p pandemic. Every person that I know with a small business is on the verge of losing his or her business. You know what that mm -hmm. does to somebody's mental wherewithal? Kanye is one of the biggest stars that ever existed. Mm -hmm. It may just be a possibility that he may not have been the perfect, the right fit to get in bed with corporations. That's cool. You got in bed with corporations. You learned a valuable lesson. Now you're losing your relationship with those corporations. But I don't think this is one of those things that we need to be rooting on or cheering or 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 or, or like speaking on if it doesn't it concern us. You know what I mean? Like we all know that we all hate hate speech. Everybody don't. We're all against hate speech. But who who do we hate hear hate speech about the most? Mm. you know uh, yeah. and, and it's and I even think I even think that it's inappropriate to bring it up in this context because it's almost like let me retort you know what I mean like when, when like if I say black lives matter and then you come and you say yeah white lives matter too okay yeah they do but this is the wrong context you just you just offended me by doing that you know what I mean? It's called social sensitivity and emotional intelligence. And those are the two things that I'm working on. I'm working on being able to mm. keep my thoughts to myself. I'm working on being able to choose my words a little better um, because we are guilty of it. We all are multi-layered. There's a lot of things that Kanye is doing that I think uh, th those characteristics are, are within us all. All of us are capable of jumping out, jumping out there in, in moments of frustration, lack of sleep, whatever it is, whatever it is. If it's abusing drugs, yo, man, I got a soft spot, my, a soft spot in my heart to anybody abusing drugs. I don't mm. laugh at shit like that because it's not funny when you don't mm. understand addiction. It broke my heart when DMX died and everybody said, yo, people around him knew what he was battling, and they let him do it anyway. Oh, y'all think that's how addiction works, right? Mm. Y'all think that people can fix, you think we can fix people, people can fix people. Okay, you're no longer an addict because I care about you. No. Nope, nope, nope. 
because I drink for a very long time, knowing that I wasn't going to be able to drink too too much longer. I knew I was going to have to stop one day. But whenever my, mm. whenever my wife gave me pushback or she said anything that made me feel uncomfortable about the guilt that I already had about my addiction, it made me push her away. I only wanted to be around enablers. And that's how addiction mm. works. You can't fix somebody. You can't help somebody who's not ready to be helped. If you try to, mm. if you see an elderly woman and you try to grab her groceries for her and help her across the street, and she say, I got this. Or my daughter. No, I want to do it myself. Yo, man, you got to let her do it herself. I love sure. to be able to help my daughter do every single thing, but I want her to, I want her to want her independence, you know? And sometimes that's a humbling moment as a dad to have to hear that. Mm. I taught my, I taught my five-year-old how to ride a bike, a two wheel in, in mm. pretty much one day. I got her two wheel because I was so disconnected from the house at that time. I didn't realize she was still on training wheels. So when I brought mm. the bike home, she cried and she said, Daddy, I can't ride it too well. I said, You know what, baby? We're going to have to learn. So I took her out there. I had her seat. She was riding. She didn't want me to let the seat go. She was afraid. And this is a life lesson. One of the hardest things I ever had to do as a father is let that fing seat go, bro. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. That next seat go and the possibility of her falling down mm. is a tough thing. But when you look at that in the capacity of life, yes. that's what's going to have to happen, happen in, on every level when it's time to let her go to college. We're going to all cry. We're going to hug her and we're going to hope for the best. We're going to give her the information that we are armed with. It doesn't mean she's going to be able to apply it. It just means that we pray to God that she listens, but she's going to do what she's going to do. So when I let that seat go, what was going to happen was what was going to happen. And she didn't start mm -hmm. pedaling until she wasn't scared of falling on the ground no more. And that's how you stay fly. Not being mm -hmm. afraid to fall out the sky. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's tough as a dad. And I talk, I talk to other dads about stuff like that all the time. But mm. by the time the next day came, I, I posted all this on Instagram too. By the time the next day came, she was riding around the cul-de-sac by herself. I think I've seen that, yeah. You know, man, seen that, that was, that kind of fulfillment, I got more fulfillment out of that than I got out of any record that I ever made in my life. So mm. it made me even just rethink the amount of time I spend at the studio versus the amount of time I spend at home. It changes mm. you, man. Having having children changes you. Mm. How the girls I, I change you versus how the boys change you, that changes you. Having mm. public spats, falling out with people publicly. You know, Ahmad, mm. man, I never had a problem getting along with people in high school. Mm. Yo, man, I had like 30 people calling my house phone. My dad used to hate that shit. My dad hated how many mm. friends I had. It wasn't until I got into the music business that I started getting in all this beef and having all these disagreements and trying to adjust to how the Romans do. But I'm a naturally mm. peaceful guy. I'm just emotional. Mm. You know? So social construct, the social construct told me that I can only be emotional, I can only show emotion by saying, I'm going to beat your ass. Mm. And I will. And I will. Yeah. But I don't walk around every day thinking about, ooh, who's asking I be today? I love mm. helping people. I get more fulfillment out of helping people than I've ever got fulfillment out of punching somebody in the face. Mm. We just been taught wrong. We've been That's taught right. wrong. It's like a, it's like we got to have a do-over as black men. Like we had to develop this mm. hard, this hard core, out, outer core to guard our intimate feelings to keep us safe that was our defense mechanism and sometimes we got to break away from that we got to stop chasing trying to find ourselves and we have to arrive at a place
We got to get there, wherever that is. Arrive at that place. And wherever that place is, that's where you're living in the center of your truth. And you okay with everybody not liking you. And you okay with everybody not liking your music. You okay with some people being more, quote unquote, successful than you. You okay because you you have an understanding of what happiness is. I don't mm. want to be the richest man in the world, bruh. If all of the most valuable things on earth was piled up in my studio right now, all I would do is take what's mine, what I work for, mm. what I deserve. And I would leave the rest for the world to sort out. I don't want anything more than what I deserve. But, but. I'm not taking any less than what I came for. That's, a that's it. You that's know a what I'm saying? And that's I it. To I ask wish you. everybody thought like that because I feel like it's people who just want it all. They want every. They want mine. They want yours. They want. And this is the, this mm. is the business that I'm in. So it's been tough mm. for me to um, to navigate through it, being fair. I'm a fair person. I need to look myself in the mirror. I haven't done everything perfect i haven't done everything right but i can't say i can honestly look in the mirror and say that I, i've wronged i've wronged nobody i have not wronged anybody i've had disagreements mm. i've done things that people thought that i should have handled different i agree to that and i have no pop no problem apologizing for that but i'm not gonna be anybody's doormat either mm. so my reconcile to that is stop airing things out publicly. Bun B told me that a long time ago, and I didn't listen. Mm. But you'll never see me do that again. I don't care what it's mm. about. Mm. Because, you know, if you could, people are watching. That's a fact. People are watching. If you could, you know, last question. If you could recommend one book for personal growth, what, what book would you recommend? Like, or maybe it could be a lecture, you know. People don't like reading books nowadays, like you said, listen to or lecture a good a good lecture. Um I know you talked about um uh, a lot of the trauma being in, in, in our DNA, you know, and coming from slavery, just thinking about post traumatic uh slave syndrome and Dr. Joyce and her whole lecture on that. But what would be a book that you recommend or something that you would recommend for personal growth? For personal growth? Um, you talking mm -hmm. about on a spirit? Level, financial level, you think you're talking about the dollar. Thinking, I would say, think and grow rich. Think and grow rich is think and grow rich is a, is a book that I'm reading now. Um, I think it's a good book to read for financial for financial growth. Not that you read the book and your finances will grow, but mm. it will give you a hell of a perspective. Because I personally don't think. I know other groups of people are the richest people on the planet. And I'm, I'm also aware that black people are at the bottom of the social economic scale. And we've been there the whole time. Right. So, um, a lot of, a lot of people went into the clubhouse room and Elon Musk was in there dropping jewels and everybody was just like, yo, I want to listen to him because he's a billionaire. I want to hang with billionaires. Mm. I think that's cool. I think that's cool. But um, I think Tyler Perry can teach me way better than Elon Musk can teach me anything. I don't think anybody, any group of people understands the black experience like black people. So, I mean, Elon Musk is somebody I love to have a relationship with. I'm sure that there's plenty that I can learn from him. But I don't think he can teach me how to be a billionaire like Robert Johnson. Tyler mm. Perry. Robert Johnson. You know, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. I was just on the phone with Chris Webber for an hour. That's what took me a minute to to, to get on to get on the stream. Mm -hmm. Yo, that man, that man is brilliant. He's 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 full of knowledge. You know what I mean? Be because when you talk to a successful black man who's broken through that barrier that exists, you're talking about somebody who was able to do it through through trial and error. You know, so they, we learned a lot of our lessons through making mistakes, especially me. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of other black men 
have learned how to become extremely successful within the paradigm that exists already, that's already controlled and there's a, other groups of people in power already. The biggest mistake you can make is to get in bed with that infrastructure and start wanting to change it around. We wouldn't allow that. If it was ours, this is my studio. Mm. I own this studio. I'm going to let somebody come in here and tell me how, this, how some going to go around here. Nah, bro, you going to have to get out. You know what I mean? So the way we get around that is we have some people who have the perfect or a club or a good enough personality trait where they know how to play well with others. They know how to pick their words properly. They know how to be charismatic, charming, never disrespectful and productive, you know, and, and some people can help through just their actions. They don't have to say much. How often do you hear Jay-Z talk? How often do you hear Beyonce talk? Never. How, often? How many words Rarely have you ever. heard them say? Yeah. They don't you, talk. You, you, it's you, the action. You see more articles. Yeah, you see more articles. They just do. Mm. They just do. But you know what? That's the that's what they do. And then you have some people where we need them to be vocal. Mm. You know? And then you have some people that operate outside of the paradigm and have a little more leeway to say maybe whatever they want to say. I use Tyler Perry as an example because um, I've been following him for a long time and I've seen interviews and things where he was talking about he never could get a call back from Hollywood. You know, he had aspirations of being in Hollywood. He never could get a call back in Hollywood. So he was forced to, you know, go on writing retreats and write, you know, produce classic films about black people mm -hmm. you know like it's like everybody act like black black ain't viable commercially viable when has it not been this man has made nothing but movies for black people about black people and he's a billionaire mm -hmm. and and a lot of those movies weren't in, even done in hollywood Mm. A lot of, them. you know, if that's not, if that don't tell you what you need to know, then what, what, what else would there be? It's more than one way to skin a cat, you know, and you still never hear that man be disrespectful. He still, mm. he still gets in bed with Hollywood companies and does his movies and accepts his Emmys and he's just as respectful, but there's always a message. Be your own boss. Mm. When you hear it from him, mm. it resonates different, you know? We don't got to get up there and be like, yeah, no, you know what I'm saying? Black power, no, you know what I'm saying? Like, man, we, we passed all that. Yeah. We passed all that. It's, it's just about, it's about self-awareness and being able to read the room, understanding where you can mm. fit in, getting in that position, taking that position, and doing your part. And if you can, through God's grace, pull somebody else up who's like-minded and put them in position. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know what That's I mean? I mean, That's and I learned, and I know I've been rambling, I've been rambling on about a lot of things that are culture, but mm -hmm. what I need people to understand is that culture and mental health go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you start to delve into mental health a little bit, you're going to find Yo, when I start going to, I go to AA meetings sometimes. I'm not real big on AA meetings because they tend to make me sad. I don't like to be sad mm. because sadness is one of my triggers for alcohol. You, know, I used to mm. drink when I got sad, so I don't like being sad. I like being happy. Mm. You know, so I talk one on one with a therapist. I usually leave out of there in good spirits. When I go to the gym, I leave out of there in good spirits. I go to AA meetings and I hear sad stories stories that are 10 times worse than mine and the only thing good that i can take out of it in that moment due to the way that my emotional my emotional capacity is set up is i can only compare and say damn i thought my problems mm -hmm. were bad people got way yeah. worse problems than me 
And it's not about black or white or nothing like that. It's just we are addicts. Mm. Damn near like a race. You know what I mean? Mm. So I have to personally, I have to personally be in a particular mood in order to go to AA, but I would never, never um encourage people not to go to AA because it's actually one of one of the 12 steps. You know, you have some people mm. in the sobriety world who swear by AA so much that if you say you don't go to AA, then they look at you like, nah, you're not really in recovery. I don't really agree with that. Um, no, any more than I agree with, you know, marriage has to be a certain way, you know, gender roles or whatever. Marriage should just be an understanding. And if both parties agree on that, it's going to be a beautiful thing. If you force, if you force tradition on somebody, then, you know, you run the risk of, of things going wrong. You know what I mean? So AA to mm. me falls under the category of tradition. I recommend it to people because I think it will work for most people. Somebody like myself, um, I'm a little bit popular. Um, I go to AA meetings. People ask me for pictures. Mm. I, You know, that's not really, that's not the comfort zone for me. It's a different experience yeah. for me. And I, le- I leave out of there just feeling kind of like, what if I want to, you know, what if I don't want nobody to know I was in here today, you know? I just walk out of there feeling like, you know, I, I wasn't in control of that situation. And I heard a bunch of sad stories. I think I'll just stick to the one-on-one. But I think I think for the most part, AA would work for most people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But that's all AA is. That's all AA is. It's therapy. It's therapy. It's an opportunity for you to share stories with people and let you know that you're not alone. You know? It's lonely being an alcoholic, bro. Why, why do you think... Mm-hmm. Where do you think the phrase misery loves company came from? How many times have you seen people say, come on, this take a drink with me? Come on, this can do one more with me. Who want to sit around, who want to sit around and kill themselves slowly by themselves? <laughs> mm. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's kind of like how I look at that. Am I rambling too much? Because I love talking about this. No, thing. no, 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 no. Uh, that, that's <laughs> what I love about it. You, you give me a topic, man, you can speak on it. And that just shows how passionate and deeper than being passionate it shows that you lived it. You know what I'm saying? That's, yeah. that's the things that I can talk about for hours. And it's cause I lived it. It's just like, yeah, you give me a topic that I lived. I can talk about it for hours, man. But um, I really appreciate yeah. you just jumping on live with me and, and doing this. Like I said, I know you're a busy man. Um, and for you to do this just off the strength, off the love, man, like that really means a lot, man. Um, just, just opening yourself up just to, to be accessible, man, and just respond when, when, when I'm able to reach out and just ask for advice and different things, man. I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. I like, for real. Come friend. on, black guy. When I asked you to do, Come on, black when I asked you to do the on, first black interview years Anything. ago on, on, on my IG Live, <laughs> when I asked you to do the interview years ago, and you and you was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's put it together. I was like, man, like. It, it, it's just always been yeah. love and, and I'm humble, man. Like I, I know a lot of people try to, but I'm humble, like for real, man. Uh, so I really appreciate you doing this with, uh, with me, man. And, um, everybody who appreciated this live, man, um, definitely make sure you give it a like once it's posted up to the page, man, and be on the lookout for more of these conversations, man. Um, this is just the IG live conversation. My mind deployed is Royce to five nine. We appreciate y'all for tuning in, man. Love and respect to you always, my young brother. Peace, man. Peace. Peace.